to everybody for coming to today's presentation. And um, I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to welcome Kai Ling Kang um, to UVM and, um, and to hear the inf important information she's going to share with us. Uh, Kay Ling works with uh, Len Epstein at the um, New York University at uh, Buffalo, and um, they are, without question, one of the nation's premier institutions, the world's premier institutions in the study of childhood obesity. And um, But before I, I say more about that, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the background of our speaker. So uh, Kay Ling got her undergraduate degree at Drake University in Iowa, and then uh, state, it was in um, chemistry and more uh, hard sciences, and then went on to study uh, nutritional sciences in, in um, graduate school. She did her uh, master's and PhD at Iowa State in the area of nutritional sciences, and then on to work with, um, with Len. Um, the topic that Kay Ling is going to talk to us about today is um, looking at, uh, well, the overall topic you see, but uh, I want to make a plug for the process that she's looking at, at which is the role of reinforcement in, um, as a risk for um, over, enhanced reinforcing effects of food as a risk factor for childhood obesity. Um, and you would think anybody who knows about reinforcement knows that er almost everything we learned about the basic principles of reinforcement were learned with food reinforcement. Yet here we find ourselves in the obesity epidemic, and if you read the obesity uh, literature, they often don't talk about reinforcement unless you're uh, Read and Len or some a smaller subgroup, so it's it's a, a, a weird irony, but you get those in um, in in health and, and science generally. So I am really thrilled. I think the work that's that's you're going to hear about is is truly cutting edge. We're uh, anxious, and that's one of the reasons we had Kayleen come up. Is we're anxious to try and get some. A collaboration, collaborative work going on that same topic here at the University of Vermont. Um, I think it, it could really help us understand risk for obesity much better than we uh, do now. So, without any further ado, I please join me in welcoming Kaylin. Um, thank you so much for the gracious introduction. And definitely it's a pleasure for me to share with you some of the work that I've been doing as a postdoc for the uh, past two and a half year um, in the area of infant eating behavior, behavior, I would say, more so from the angle of reinforcement. Hopefully this will work. So for today's talk, um, first I will give you a li just a little bit background on obesity, childhood obesity, specifically in, uh, among the infant's population. Then I will share with you a paradigm that I developed during my postdoc year, the infant food reinforcement paradigm. Next, we will look at an intervention that I just currently uh, finished conducting by re reducing infant's motivation to eat using a music program. There are still many questions yet to be answered in the area, in the area of infant uh, eating behavior, and I would like to share with you some of the current work that I'm doing, and of course, what is the future, what are the future directions in the area of reinforcement in terms of uh, obesity during infancy. So we know that child obesity is a uh, um, severe modern society problem. And we also know that one third, if not more, of children in this country are either overweight or obese. And it is predicted that the next generation of children will be more obese and uh, less physically active than the current, current uh, existing generation. Those who 
are obese or overweight during childhood, they will have a higher risk to become overweight or obese later in life. Not to mention, there are so many health outcomes associated with childhood obesity. This is just a short list that, um, that I could show you today here. So, um, systematic review um, indicate at best uh, behavior and nutrition intervention in schools and between the home really have really limited success in preventing uh, weight gain during childhood. Uh, to be truly comprehensive and successful in preventing this, stopping this uh, obesity epidemic, uh, effort targeting the youngest population, those who are two years or younger, is really urged by NIH right now. Indeed, in 2013, NIH put forth an effort um, to bring in together all the scientists that are currently look, uh, working on uh, infancy work and infant obesity work to start to, to discuss what we know about obesity during infancy and what kind of intervention we should be looking for um, to prevent obesity at such a young age. So I have the um, privilege to attend this workshop, and this is when I realized the severity of uh, obesity during infancy and the importance of stopping obesity right when the baby is born. So after this uh, workshop, I decided for my future career path, I want to um, develop innovative solution um, to stop obesity epidemic at, during infancy. That being said, uh, actually not a lot of people, every time when I was telling someone that I'm doing obesity work and in infants, they always give me this really weird look like, what do you mean obesity during infancy? How could you say a baby can be obese? So if you don't believe, this is just one example, how shocked a mother when was being confronted um, with their baby being obese. So this is what she said. I would like to read it to you. For the first six months of my son's life, everyone commented on his weight. Strangers felt perfectly comfortable saying, look at those fanta dice and you have got yourself a little sumo wrestler. Meanwhile, I wasn't the least bit faced by the skill at checkups or how many ounces my little guy consumed. He was a baby after all, and babies are supposed to have those amazing chunking, a chunky arm roll, aren't they? It never occurred to me that a baby could be considered overweight or that I had to consider my son's risk for childhood obesity before his first birthday. This is just one example how short a mom get when uh, she was being told her, her son is going to have high risk to be obese later in life. And so what is the definition of obesity during infancy? So here is a growth chart, um, weight for length for girls uh, from birth to two years old. And according to both WHO and CDC, if a child's um, weight for length, Z score is uh, at 85 percentile or greater, he or she would be considered overweight. If a child, if a baby's uh, weight for length Z score is 95 or above, he or she would be considered obese. Uh, according to the latest uh, enhanced data in United States, about 10% of the infants would be considered obese, and this is not even included those who are overweight. There are many health consequences related to uh, rapid weight gain during infancy. Already at, during, uh, as an infant, uh, rapid weight gain predicted higher um, developmental delays, uh, hospital admission rates, and respiratory issues. At age three years old, rapid weight gain, again during infancy, predicted higher BMI, fat mass, and blood pressure. 
um, similarly at age six, six to eight years old, so, rapid weight gain predicted higher fat mass and diastolic blood pressure. Rapid weight gain also predicted higher fat mass and poorer metabolic risk score during adult lessons and also um, higher obesity rate during adulthood. So what causes um, infant obesity? What are some of the uh, modifiable risk factors? When um, uh, overweight or obese uh, pregnant woman or woman who gains excessive weight during pregnancy uh, predicted higher uh, obesity, infant's obesity risk. Um, infants who consistently experience short sleep durations uh, has a higher risk, uh, have, has a rapid weight gain during infancy. And the definition of short sleep duration here for infants is less than 12 hours in a 24 hours period. Um, feeding practices is associated with uh, infant's obesity. Here, example of uh, feeding practices would be um, early introduction of solid food, to some extent, uh, short duration of breastfeeding. Infant eating behaviors is also associated with uh, risk of uh, infant obesity. Example of infant eating behaviors are picky eater, um, slow eater, fast eater. Unfortunately, we really don't know much about um, physical activity during infancy and how that is related to uh, childhood, uh, infant's obesity. Among all of these um, risk factors, I'm particularly interested in understanding infant's motivation to eat or infant food reinforcement. Um, Food is a primary reinforcer, which means infants really do, know, do need to learn to want food. Infants innately engage in uh, nutritive sucking for survival purposes, and it is pleasurable. So some studies actually have shown that um, early sucking responses, early sucking pattern is associated with infant weight status. A more avid sucking pattern is positively related to uh, weight gain. From that literature background, it got me thinking it might be these sucking patterns can explain why some infants find food more reinforcing than others, or some infants are more motivated to eat. That's why they suck more. That's why they want the milk more compared to some other infant might not care about eating that much. So um, what is the meaning of uh, food reinforcement? We, we don't always think about our motivation to, do, to eat in our daily life. And if you want something, we will just go to get something, right? So what is really the meaning of reinforcement, food reinforcement. Again, it is the motivation to eat. It is actually a measure of how hard someone will work to gain access to a speci specific food. So how does it work? So I know Ben and Jerry is from Vermont. Let's use Ben and Jerry as an example. Uh, how many of you like to eat Ben and Jerry's? Raise your hands. Okay, great. I'm really glad so many of you. So let's say that um, we have some Ben and Jerry's ice cream outside this auditorium. How many of you will go out and grab some? Great. So let's say Ben and Jerry is, I don't even know how far the factory is from here. Let's say Ben and Jerry is five miles away from here. How many of you would drive to get some? Good. So let's say Ben and Jerry is out of the state, New York State, maybe 100 miles away from here. How many of you would want to drive there to get some? No? So this is just an example for me to understand your reinforcement. How motivated are you by Ben and Jerry's? How much effort you would put in to try to get this food? 
However, in our daily life, we are really faced with choices uh, on how to spend our resources, right? So eating is not the only thing that you engage in, and food is not the only thing that you enjoy. You, you might like to do some other activities. For some of you, might be skiing or running, right? So really, this relative food enforcement allows us to understand, to compare one's motivation to eat versus motivation for others' activities. So one example would be, um, what is more reinforcing to you? To drive five miles to get Ben and Jerry's or to drive five miles to come to my talk today, <laughs> right? <laughs> so since all of you are here in this room, so I know which is more reinforcing to you. <laughs> so relative reinforcing value has been measured um, in preschoolers, children, adolescents, and adults. All of these above study have shown that the overweight and obese um, population find food more reinforcing than the non-food alternative. How, despite the success of measuring food reinforcement um, in other population, it has been hindered um, by the lack of measure uh, in children less than three years old to understand the development of food reinforcement really has been hindered by the lack of measure. And um, it is really impossible for us to use a questionnaire to ask the baby to rate how much they like certain things, how much they will work for certain things. And the com computerized task that uh, LAN has developed is, is development, developmentally really is inappropriate for the infants to complete themselves and due to the skill that they need to click the mouse button and different reason. So I decided after attending the uh, NIH workshop, I decided I'm going to take on the task to figure out if I can come out a paradigm that will allow me to measure uh, food reinforcement, human food reinforcement. I know there's some work that have been done in animals and rats. And to allow that human infants to, to work to gain access to, to either food or non-food uh, reinforcer. So I set forth to develop a paradigm to study the relative food reinforcement among infants 9 to 18 months old. So some of you might ask, why do I choose 9 to 18 months, months old? So this is an age group that all, if not most of them, have been introduced to solid food. So they have um, the ability to finger feed themselves due to the mastery of their pencil grass. And this is also an age group that if not all of them, most of them would, would express all done or finish by head turning, saying all done or signing all done, and they can sit, sit out, right? All of these developmental milestones are really important for them to actively respond to the task. And I also set forth to exam examine whether the reinforcing value of uh, food and non-food alternatives are related to infant uh, weight status. So um, we know that infants really don't do much beside eating during infancy, right? So it was actually not easy at first for me to figure out, okay, what should I use as a non-food reinforcer? So I know that I'm going to use infant's favorite food for the food portion of the task. So what should I do with the non-food? So after much discussion with uh, colleagues and friends that have young children, for the first study, I decided I'm just going to use baby Einstein to see if that would work. So for the first study, um, we have 27 infants enrolled and finished the task. And again, here the non-food reinforcer is the Baby Einstein DVD. And the food portion of the task is the uh, infant's favorite food. For this population, we have about half uh, baby boys and half baby girls. And most of them are um, high uh, SDS population. Since this was my first time running through the paradigms, 
I want to reduce subject variability, so I set certain inclusion and exclusion criteria. Here is just some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria for my population. Here is the setup of the lab. I'm going to go through this um, setup with you, since some of you might be interested in the future to do some of uh, this work. So this is, again, is a computerized task. So I usually have two researchers run the task. One researcher will serve as the feeder, I call feeder, because she will be the one that provides the reinforcer. Another researcher will serve as the gamer, the person who controls the computer. Um, a Logitech wireless touch mouse will serve as a big button for the baby to press the button uh, to earn reward. So the baby will have to press to specific amount of uh, button presses in order for the researcher want to give uh, he or she the, re, uh, the reinforcer. As the, as the task progresses, it becomes harder to earn reward. The baby will have to press more button. So the, the baby have to press more its reputation in, instead of the string. So the baby just have to keep pressing the button to earn the reward. So the baby would be seated at the high chair during the task and we allow mother to be in the room with the infants uh, due, to, um, the ba due to separation anxiety and anxiety surrounding stranger uh, experienced by babies during at this age group. So when um, the baby earned the food portion of the task, a piece of their favorite food would present to them and they would be encouraged to consume them right away. When the nine foot reinforcer, in this case, is the uh, baby Einstein, if the baby earn the baby Einstein DVD, we will let the baby watch 10 to 12 second uh, clip of the show. These two reinforcer is counterbalanced between, uh, so this, these two reinforcer is counterbalanced among the infants, which means half of the infants might, would get the food as the first reinforcer, another half would get the baby Einstein DVD as the first reinforcer. So the baby would just play, keep playing the task, playing the games until they give sign wanting to um, be done or they said no or done, then we will stop the game. So I will show you a video of how this task work in the lab. The first portion of the video is a training session. We use funny sound to train the infants to manipulate the mouse. So once we know that the infants understand what it means to press the button, what they will gain, then we will start the um, task. For this video, the first part is the food um, reinforcer task. The second part is the non-food reinforcer.
two. Mm -hmm. So this is just a short clip of um, how they do the task. So this is how um, we quantify and analyze the uh, result. So infant relative food reinforcement was quantified as food reinforcing ratio. So I will be using the term throughout uh, the rest of my presentation, FRR. So during the task, we collected the maxim maximum button presses for the food and the non-food. So FRR is um, calculated as the proportion of the total, uh, the proportion of food uh, button presses in comparison to the total uh, responses will be the food plus the non-food. Um, so let's say, for example, Tommy has, a, has five button presses for food and three button presses for non-food. Tommy's FRR would be um, 0 0.625. We will consider Tommy have a high FRR in this case because more than half of his button presses are for the food portion of the task. We also collected baby's heart and weight um, during this uh, procedure. Here is the result of my first study. So this graph showed infant's um, obesity status. The green is the lean, the overweight obese in the red color. This first study showed that um, then the y-axis is the FR score. And this first study showed that overweight and obese infants really have a significantly higher FRR score compared to the lean infants. However, interestingly, when we look at uh, separately the maximum button presses for the food itself and also the ma maximum button presses for the uh, non-food itself, which is the DVD, we actually did not see a significant difference among infants, uh, the lean and overweight obese infants in terms of their maximum button presses for food. We saw that infants, uh, the lean infants, has had a significantly higher uh, maximum button presses compared to the overweight obese infants um, to gain access to the DVD. We have quite a big effect size with uh, such a small sample size. When we look at the continuous variable, um, we saw that FRR is positively related to weight falling z-score of the infants. When we look at monthly weight gain, after accounting for infant's birth weight, birth weight we, still see, we still could see this significant positive association. So, um, so we got ourselves some really amazing data, right? So it was... Um, it is too good to be true, right, after all. So I wanted to replicate my, my study. And for this time, I, I want to use another non-food reinforcer to see if I can find the same result. After much discussion with uh, colleagues and uh, friends that have young children, for my second study, I decided um, I'm going to use uh, blowing bubbles as my uh, non-food reinforcer. So. The good thing about blowing bubble is it's more representing an active play. When we look at the baby Einstein, um, people might criticize that it's sanitary activity, and we don't encourage sanitary activity uh, for children. So for this study, we have um, 30 infants uh, recruited and completed the task. Again, we have half of them are baby boys and half, half of them are baby girls. If you don't believe how reinforcing bubbles is, here's one uh, 
a zumber. Good job. <laughs> Push the button for more bubbles. Good job. Good job. Do you want more bubbles? So it's really reinforcing. I want to play with bubble too myself. So let me see. So for this second study, um, again, we saw that the overweight obese infants uh, score higher, significantly higher in FRR compared to the uh, non-infant, uh, non, uh, the lean infants. Surprisingly, again, we did not see significant in the maximum pattern presses for the food. But we saw that the lean infants uh, has a significantly higher maximum button presses for the barbers compared to uh, the overweight obese infants. So for the continuous variable, again, we saw a positive uh, relationship between Z weight falling and FRR of the infants and also the monthly weight gain of the infants with FRR. With these two studies, I can conclude that infant weight status is associated with uh, FRR. This relationship is strongly driven by the non-food reinforcer instead of the food, part, food portion of the task. Maybe a lack of access to pleasurable uh, alternative in infant's life, life could cause obesity. The natural, um, the natural next question I have in this area of research is that can we increase the reinforcing value of non-food alternatives among infants who are highly motivated to eat, right? In order to find question to, uh, in order to find answer to my question, I decided to collaborate with um, the Music Together program. Um, locally, we have the Betty's Music Together, and we, I decided to collaborate with her to come out with intervention that would allow me to test uh, my hypothesis. Um, Music Together um, is a very really unique uh, program. It introduces young infants to the pleasure of music making together with their parents. This uh, program uh, provides a variety of uh, activities, uh, instruments and music for the infants and the family. So this is a randomized control trial. Uh, we have 27 infants enrolled in the study in two separate cohort. Instead of a passive control, we, we want to have an active control um, for this study. So for the active control, it's a play dates group. So the purpose of this study really is to assess the effects of a six weeks a music program on the relative reinforcing value of food among infants 9 to 16 months old with high motivation to eat. So here the definition of high motivation would be FRR that is uh, 0.5 or above. So we screen out infants that, um, infants that don't have FRR 0.5 or above, we will not include them in the study. So after the uh, screening, we randomized them to this music group and the playdates group, 14 of them in the music and 13 in the playdates. They attended the 45 minutes weekly classes. One parent would serve as the participating parents. Besides attending all the classes, they are also encouraged to practice at home. For the music group, um, we give them CD and songs book for the parents to um, practice with their infants. For the playdates group, we give them the um, uh, Fisher Price Baby First Blocks. We also actually employ some of the components of the ecological moment intervention for this study. And they were reminded daily to practice with their infants at home using a text system that we have. They also are required to fill out the daily home practice survey once they are done with the practice. 
Weekly, uh, they can be entered into lottery drawing if they fill up five out of seven of the uh, weekly survey and also they attend class on time. So two families drop out from the study and they were included in the intent to treat analysis. And beside these two families, all families attended all of the classes. We have 85% from both groups um, fill out the home practice survey. And on average, um, the uh, family in the music group uh, practice the music 1.4 times per day. And the play dates group play with the play dates twice 1.6 times per day. Uh, we use mixed ANOVA to analyze uh, the change in FRR, uh, the maximum uh, button presses for the food, and in this case, is the maximum button presses for the music. So this result show that um, after the six-week intervention, uh, we saw a significant uh, decrease in FRR among the infants in the music group. So the y-axis is the change in FRR compared to the play dates group. However, surprisingly, when we look at the individual, the maximum, the absolute reinforcing value, we saw a significant decrease in the maximum button presses for uh, infants in the music group compared to the play dates group, but we did not see a significant increase in the reinforcing value of music uh, compared to the control group. With such a short duration of the intervention, we actually didn't really expect any change in the weight of the babies in terms of significant difference between the group. However, we saw that the infants in the music group actually has a lower change in Z weight for length compared to the infants in the control group. It is not significant, but it is trending towards that direction. So I can conclude that, yes, it is possible to increase the reinforcing value of non-food alternatives with an intervention. By providing infants uh, pleasurable non-food alternatives at home might decrease their motivation to eat. This might ultimately alter the trajectory of unnecessary weight gain among infants. So with all of this uh, study, uh, with all of this study and the results, where do we go, go from here? What is next? Um, some of the work that I've been doing right now uh, include uh, finding answer to the question, what are the long-term effects? of the music enhancement program in infants who are highly motivated to it. So we saw that the six-week intervention is a really short uh, intervention and a short duration. So what are some of the long-term effects? In order to find answer to this uh, question, I recently submitted an R1 grant to assess change in food, non-food reinforcement, infant energy intake, uh, wait for length Z score and enhance home environment of these infants over a 24 month period. Again, it's using this Music Together program. Um, I'm very glad to um, announce that we are at a really good standing to get this grant funded. Hopefully, we can get this work started um, this summer. Um, this is actually the very first time a human. Uh, human food reinforcement paradigms being developed. These paradigms have um, received quite a great deal of uh, attention in the field, and it has been called a methodological game changer by the editorial of American Journal of Clinical Nutrition because it enables the study of potential genetic inference and gene environment interplay in the emergence of re uh, relative value of food. However, there is one question remain unanswered. Is that, is this uh, paradigm that I, I developed is a reliable, um, reliable and valid uh, tool? So to answer to this question, I recently got funded um, with a grant 
to run a test retest study to demonstrate that infants will reach a relative consistent breakpoints, which is the maximum button presses for obtaining food and non-food alternatives, which means we can reliably measure FRR in the lab and it is a stable trait uh, in the infants. I'm more than halfway done with the data collection and right before this talk, and I actually look at my data and it looks really promising, so stay tuned with it. The next question is, can we measure infant food reinforcement in infants younger than nine months old before the introduction of solid food? This is a very important next step of understanding infant eating behavior because um, it is the transition from eating pure breast milk or formula to the introduction of other food sources. So, to answer this question, we recently uh, got funded by the Impact Grant to develop a cutting edge technology that will allow us to measure uh, infants' food reinforcement among three to six months old infants by manipulating their sucking responses. And to do this work, we have to collaborate with a um, biomechanical engineer, and he's currently developing the device now. And hopefully, in couple of months, uh, we will have the products and we can start running some babies. Last question, what are the predictors of infants with relatively high motivation to eat? Every time when I present my work, people always ask, so why? So what are the predictors? What causing, you know, some infants have high uh, food reinforcement? So by combining all my data right now, um, I have 110, 106 infants. Um, we saw that some of the prenatal and postnatal uh, uh, fact risk factors really contributed to this uh, high food reinforcement among infants. Here, um, the prenatal factors uh, would be the preparency BMI and maternal gestational weight gain. For the postnatal factors, um, is the breastfeeding duration. I'm interested to use this data as the basis of a new R01 grant to uh, respond to a current um, recent announcement by the NIH uh, grant announcement to understand factors in infancy and early childhood, birth to 24 months, that influence obesity development. Um, being able to develop a paradigm that answered the many questions I have in infants' eating behavior has really been a fruitful and productive and exciting postdoc experience. And however, apart from uh, continuing gaining understanding and deeper understanding of um, infant eating behavior, infant food reinforcement, I'm also um, really interested in the other uh, spectrum of the energy balance skill, which is uh, energy expenditure through uh, physical activity. So for the future direction, I foresee myself starting to develop, starting to understand the origin of physical activity reinforcement. And we know that some infants or even some, some people or animal even, giving the same environment um, response so differently with physical activity. As I was preparing this talk, I came across this uh, Facebook uh, video. I thought it explained perfectly of my points, so I'm going to show you if it works. Right? <laughs> so, um, some studies have really shown that in, uh, reinforcing value of physical activity is correlated with physical activity level among children 6 to 11 years old. So, when do these individual differences begin? Anecdotally, some parents will say, oh, my infants try to run around get into everything, jump up to everything, climb up to everything, was there since birth. But we really don't know, right? So 
being so if a able to develop a paradigm that measure uh, the origin of uh, uh, infants' physical activity could help with future intervention um, to help those children who find uh, physical activity really not reinforcing to them. So another area that I foresee myself getting into is understanding reinforcement beginnings in the womb. Um, so it might be too late uh, to understand um, to understand reinforcement when a baby outside of the womb, because we know that uh, brain development uh, starts uh, during infancy, right? And can what a mother eat or what a mother does during uh, pregnancy that uh, activate the dopamine release of the mesolimbic reward system? I, I personally, I don't know. And it would be a really good question to ask. And so some animal study actually have shown that not so much this one uh, human study. Some animal study have shown that um, what a mother eat during infancy, uh, during pregnancy, so the offspring food preferences is really affected by what the mother consumes during infants, uh, during the pregnancy periods. Using those information um, could really help us to really um, expand our understanding of reinforcement. It might be just too late when a baby is outside of the womb if we want to do any changes. So I would like to conclude my talk today by emphasizing that obesity prevention uh, is never too soon to start. Uh, infancy, if not pregnancy, is uh, an opportune window for the true prevention of uh, obesity epidemic. Thank you for your uh, patience and listening to my talk. Thank you. Um, for the, sorry, so what do you mean? Like what, what non-food reinforcer I use for the music is music. So it would be a CD that we play the music with instruments in front of the babies. So that is the re non-food reinforcer versus the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really good question. <laughs> so, um, so when you eat food, really, food produces this pleasure is dopamine release, right? So if you, <laughs> we are trying to develop this alternative in their life that will give them the same sensation, the same pleasure. Could it be they do no longer need to find food to get those pleasure? Ideally, I would like to say that my intervention helped to increase the dopamine release, right? When the music is played, when the music is played at home, when they were playing with instruments, right? And we also have to think about substitution. You know, you can't really eat when you like playing certain instruments. So that itself decreases the amount of time you spend on eating too, right? So this what? <laughs> I think to answer your question, yep, my speculation. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating comment. I think it's a great presentation, but if it didn't increase the reward value of the music, would they somehow decrease the reward value of the non music? Or is it that at all? It's just that they've learned some other behavior through all these different substitutional behaviors. So we, we, we don't, at this stage, because this is just a pilot study, that's why we have the long, longer term intervention to look at it. We did see increase in the music reinforcement, but it's not significant between the group. 
We are hoping by a bigger sample size, we can really see the differences between the group. And also the intervention is a whole one year intervention with a magnum phase. So hopefully that will solidify our finding. Really, we can see this change in the reinforcing value of music. Mm -hmm. In the early studies with the um, comparison of the food and the non-food reinforcers, so the infants weren't differing on the maximal output for food, but it was for the other. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you're almost tapping into, in that paradigm, what you're after with physical activity. Is it, am I interpreting right that the overall activity level for, for some of the infants was, was lower, so that they end up, even though they did the same amount for food, they weren't, yep. some of the infants weren't willing to be active for the non drug the non -drug. So another way to look at the data is Lean infant like both, food, non-food, everything, right? But your overweight obese infant really like the food, but they don't care about other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's true. I mean, that's a that's an important observation, I think. Yep. So it's it isn't so much that at an absolute level that the food is more reinforcing. It's just well, relative, like you're saying, but it's also that the other reinforcers don't really control as much. And so that's going to translate into lower activity levels. So mm -hmm. right. Yep. So it seems like, uh, overall, I just want to commend you, it seems like a really promising research direction. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think in the area of obesity research, researchers have really focused targeting the food portion, the food part of, of the environment. And we are really exhorting ourselves in this area and no result really have not been successful, right? Why do we focus on so much on food? The more you ask someone to eat, the more they want to eat, you know? And, and by, by altering, by divert, diverting, you know, their attention to others' activity might have the result what we are looking for. And I think this is really exciting. And Len also recently got a grant to look at the alternative reinforcer in some of the children. Um, he does more younger children's population, 6 to uh, 12 years old, I believe. And just look at their environment and understand why, what are some of the, um, protected factor for those uh, who are lean, so. We have time for one more question. Yeah. I'm uh, curious as, as to how you control for hunger. Uh, hunger, of course, is, is how we train up uh, in our animals, that we can make sure that we have yep. uh, hungry uh, uh, organisms. Uh, and, and also satiation. Um, do, do you notice a difference in terms of how hungry the lean or the uh, overweight Infants are in terms yep. of the motivation to press, and then do they do they have a the satiation curve that is different uh, depending on uh, the, the switching to the, the non food press? Okay, um, I forgot to mention that part one of the requirement for the study is the infants before they come to the lab, they are advised not to consume anything um, one hour before coming to the lab, and they should go. Uh, they shouldn't go too long without eating. In this case, no longer than three hours. So that will help us to eliminate the possibility of uh, eating due to hunger. And also we don't want them to be full, right? Coming into play. So it's the one hour that we control for. And unfortunately, I can't have the baby to fill out the satiety index score or any questionnaire to understand the satiety um, value so I can't answer that part of the questions. But we do control for the hunger for the task. Thank you. So, um, yeah, great talk. Thank you. Thank you.